All right, I've initiated recording. Uh, so we have this backup recording in addition to the live video feed that will be going to YouTube and Facebook and on here, Zoom. Allah Pa, how are you? Allah Pa, I'm well, thank you very much. How are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jamshid Afnan, uh, how was your week? And, uh, you know, the, the pandemic uh, weathering this storm that we're going through. Well, I had a great week. You know, I've been essentially uh, staying home and working from home from mid-March uh, going forward. So uh, uh, my work days and uh, home time is all become essentially one. Days becoming longer because there is no beginning and ending like when you go to a job location. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. I mean, that's, that, that means you have more efficiency. That's how I see it. More efficiency. Yes. Clearly, I don't spend any time on the road. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I do want to ask you, so uh, it, as it is nearing the, the time to start, um, do you know if uh, uh, you have uh, any friends that have difficulty joining? Um, because we were going to, we're going to be jump. developing, we'll be developing uh, two links, a Facebook and YouTube link to send out. If you'd like to uh, uh, send to anyone who needs it, we are going to be producing that and putting that into the chat so people can share that. Uh-oh, there's an image freeze. Uh, Mr. Afnan, can you hear me? Uh, Jeremiah, what just happened? Okay, um, sorry everyone, we're having uh, uh, technical difficulties as our speaker is going to be rejoining us. Our speaker is Mr. Jamshid Vahman. Uh, sorry, Jamshid Afnan. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. We, we have uh, technical difficulties coming around. We're going to be having our speaker, Jamshid Afnan, joining us very soon. Uh, Jamshid Afnan, before he joins us, I'll introduce him. He is a Baha'i author and historian. He was born in Shiraz to a Baha'i family as a fifth generation Baha'i. To further his education, he moved to the United States in the mid-1970s where he studied computer science and applied mathematics. He has been married to his wife, Nazli, for 33 years and has two children, a daughter and a son. Jamshid has always been interested in history, especially the history of the Babi and the Baha'i faiths. Transformation in the Baha'i community of Iran. So in 2016, Jamshid co-authored a book titled Stories from the Cradles of the Faith. Stories from the Cradle of the Faith. Narr narratives of heroism, sacrifice, and transformation in the Baha'i community of Iran. Professionally, Jamshid has worked in the power industry since 1980 and is currently the Chief Information and Cybersecurity Officer for the bulk power system operator for the six New England states. Jamshid has been giving talks and presentations about the different aspects of the Baha'i faith for decades. Now, uh, Mr. Afnan, it is a pleasure to have you back. Our uh, technical difficulties hopefully have resolved. God willing, the technical difficulties have resolved. I hope you can hear me. Yes, very fine. We can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Uh, should you start the presentation? Yes, so I have brought, uh, as you were reconnecting, um, I have brought forth uh, the introduction. We discussed uh, a little bit about uh, some information about you, and um, I did not say what our topic is. So our topic is about something very special to the Baha'is of the world, and next year, 
we'll be celebrating the anniversary of the centenary of the passing of Abdul Baha, who is the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, the successor of Baha'u'llah, and the center of the covenant for not just the Baha'is of the world, but we believe for this eternal faith of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future. Now, the Baha'i community is in the process of building a shrine for the earthly remains of Abdul Baha. And this is planned for dedication in November of November again of 2021. So we're talking not this year, not this November, but November 2021. Now, the Shrine of the Bab was built with a great deal of difficulty. The Bab is the forerunner, the herald of the Baha'i faith. And the difference in scope, the Bab, when his remains were uh, first interred, it was years after his martyrdom. And I'm not going to discuss this. This is the mystery that uh, Mr. Afnan has come here to speak about about this mysterious occurrence that happened in the 1800s. And more importantly, something that will be widening our perspectives as to who this personage, the Bob, who he was, and what was the significance of the interment of his remains in current day Haifa, Israel. Please, Mr. Afnan, it is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, dear friends, I'd like to start my a comments with a short prayer by His Holiness the Bab. Say, God sufficeth all things above all things, and nothing in the heavens or in the earth or in whatever lieth between them, but God, thy Lord, sufficeth. Verily, He is in Himself the knower, the sustainer, the omnipotent. Dear friends, uh, John made a, a touch on the history of the Babi Baha'i faith, and during this presentation, certain comments from other uh, writers may refer to the Babi faith. They really mean Baha'i faith on that. Additionally, for the friends that may not be familiar with the Baha'i terminology, again, the term uh, covenant breaker means somebody who disobeyed disobeyed the founder of the faith, especially in the case of succession. And that means breaking the promise and covenant breaker. So uh, without further to do, you start the presentation. Uh, and what you see here is the painting of the uh, colony of Haifa in 1877. This was what Haifa would have looked like during that period. And the Baha'u'llah uh, had made four visits to Haifa. Uh, the first one in 1868, which was a very short visit, and his stay, he was as a prisoner being transport, trans, transported toward the prison of Akka. And it was a very short stay. Then his other stays were in 1883, in 1890, and 1891. Of course, we are going to be focusing on the last visit of Baha'u'llah to, to Haifa, which that visit lasted three months. Uh, he lived in the house of Hayas Abed and the Tablet of Carmel, which is a roadmap for the prosperity of mankind was revealed during that stay. Additionally, on one occasion that the, ba the Baha'u'llah's tent was pitched on the mountain near a num number of cypress trees. You see the circle of cypress trees on this old photo of Mount Carmel. Uh, Baha'u'llah pointed to the spot below the cypress trees and gave a mission to Abdul Baha to bring the remains of the Bab from Iran uh, and build a shrine for him there. And uh, however, it appears one needs to consider what the challenging, uh, what challenges Abu Baha had ahead of him. Uh, number one, the remains of the Bab was in was it was in the hand of the Baha'is, 
because after his martyrdom, the authorities threw the remains at the edge of the moat and the Baha'is, Babis slash Baha'is, there were no Baha'is at the time. Uh, Babis, I took that and he was in hiding in the hands of the Baha'is. However, the authorities in Iran had uh, no, uh, would have loved to gotten their hand over the remains uh, of the Bab. As you know, they were very disrespectful to the remains of others, and I have no doubt they would have been disrespectful toward the remains of, of the Bab had they gotten a hold of it. The other challenge was the Baha'is themselves, out of their love and respect for the remains, if they would find out where the remains were, they would have tried to go pray and show respect toward the remains. And as the numbers would build up, uh, the authorities would have found out about it. So this was a very challenging that while certain people needed to know the number of people that were aware of it had to stay very, very controlled. Additionally, Abdul Baha himself was a prisoner and an exile. He did not have a great deal of material means and even the piece of land on the mountain did not belong to him. He had to purchase that. So uh, all of those were challenges that uh, Abdul Baha was faced with. Now, we come to today and frankly, if you look right on the side of the shrine of the Bab, you see the same cluster of the cypress trees and of course the shrine that has built. And much of our conversation today would be related to the time that the remains of the Bob uh, arrived in Holy Land. This is the, uh, uh, showing the details of the locations of the shrine of the, of the remains of the Bob uh, since his martyrdom all the way to when he was uh, buried in the bosom of Mount Carmel. However, my conversation would be from the uh, essentially January 31st, 1899, when the remains arrived in Holy Land going forward. The other conversation is a different uh, presentation and outside of the scope of our conversation today. Uh, the remains of the Bob arrived in the Holy Land by sea with the ship named Julie. Of course, on the day of its arrival, January 31st, 1899, certain cleric in Akka had passed away and he was very famous and well loved by the people of Akka. So the majority of the inhabitants of Akka had gone to the funeral of the cleric. As a result, in the customs office, there were only a couple of guards there. And once they realized that the boxes, including the box that contained the remains of the Bob, uh, belonged to Abdul Baha, they allowed it to go through. The person responsible for bringing the remains of the Bob was this gentleman here, which is Mirza Asadullah Esfahani. He was a brother in law of Abdul Baha. This photograph was taken, of course, in the United States some years later. You see in the background, people with the Western clothing. And then the remains were transferred to the house of Abdullah Pasha. This is the back of the house of Abdullah Pasha that was at that time the residence of Abdul Baha uh, in Akka. And within the house, it was taken to the room belonging to Bahia Khanam. Bahia Khanam is the older lady in this photograph, and she is uh, the sister of Abdul Baha. Uh, I, I reason I selected this picture. The room is the, the same room that the remains were hidden in there. I had heard uh, people making their assumption that the remains must have been located under her bed. However, knowing that she was extremely respectful by when she would leave the room, it was as if she was leaving a shrine. She always walked backwards. Upon entry to the room, she would prostrate herself. It would have been very unlikely that he was under the bed. Also, some of the relatives of the Bob that were in difficult times were visiting the Holy Land. And during their visit, she allowed them to have a pilgrimage 
to the remains of the Bab in her room, meaning to the box of the remains, of course. And their account of their visit is written and available, and they describe the box being positioned vertically in the closet in her room. So that is the correct location where the remains uh, was placed. Uh, upon arrival of the remains in the Holy Land, Abdul Baha also had started the construction of the shrine of the Bab. As we see here, is a partially constructed, the original component of the shrine of the Bab that was only six rooms, unlike the current that is of nine rooms. And in addition to that, Abdul Baha had asked uh, uh, the, a certain August Sayyid Mustafa Rumi, who was uh, in uh, Rangoon, Burma today, to build the sarcophagus for the, for the remains of the Bab. And the sarcophagus was built and was shipped in 1900, 1901 as a gift of the Baha'is of Rangoon. Additionally, it is an interesting point to be learned that Meshkin Galam, the celebrated calligrapher of the faith, uh, had asked Abdul Baha and been given permission to produce the designs on the sarcophagus. And he did the design. And up to that point, Meshkin Galam just assigned his work as servant of Bob and Baha Meshkin Galam. However, in this case, he signed his name as servant of Abdul Baha Meshkin Galam. This act made Abdul Baha furious because he did not want to be uh, glorified for his actions. He considered himself Abdul Baha, meaning servant of Baha. And the covenant breakers, specifically the brother of Abdul Baha, uh, Mirza Muhammad Ali, he uh, sent his younger brother, Mirza Badiullah, to Damascus with a number of gifts and others to the governor, which you see in the photo here, uh, Nazem Pasha, to ask him to investigate Abdul Baha. And they misrepresented many of the facts of the events that were taking place. Here are the charges that they had uh, petitioned uh, the governor related to the actions of Abu Baha. One, that he had rebelled against the government and established his own government. Two, that he has built fortification on Mount Carmel. Of course, the fortification was misrepresentation of the shrine of the Bab that was under construction at that time. And three, he with Mirza Zekrullah have hoisted a banner with the inscription Ya Baha'u'llah among the inhabitants and uh, including the Bedouin. Uh, Mirza <coughs> Zekrullah is the nephew, faithful nephew of Abdul Baha. And also the last charge was that he owned two thirds of the land in Akka. Uh, of course, the a commission of inquiry was sent to the Holy Land. The uh, commission, as the first part is that he was instigated by Birza Muhammad Ali. They arrived in Akwa in 1902. Uh, how, they did a very thorough job and they found Master Abdul Baha, innocent of all charges. However, the government put him under house arrest regardless. The challenge for Abu Baha was that he had rented a house at the bottom of Mount Carmel. And that was like the office dealing with the construction of the shrine. And he no longer could go to the office and supervise the construction of a shrine personally. So Abdul Baha produced, did the following solution. This is the, another picture of House of Abdullah Pasha. And as you see on the on top of the building, there is a wooden room that Abdul Baha had it constructed. This is a close-up shot of that same room. The window of that room, uh, of course, one of the windows, opens up pointed directly at the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel. If you look at this photograph that is from the side of Mount Carmel, looking at the Akka, which is the peninsula across the bay, uh, 
the house of Abdullah Pasha would be right where the peninsula, near the tip of the peninsula, looking at Mount Carmel. When you look at this picture, it of course looks hazy, uh, and that's a modern picture, air pollution. However, the reality is that at the time of Abdul Baha, it would have been crystal clear, very little air pollution in the uh, area. Uh, the construction was moving forward uh, as such. And at that point, the Sultan of Turkey, Sultan Abdul Hamid, uh, also titled Red Sultan because he was responsible for the massacre of uh, hundreds of thousands of Armenians and others. As seen, the Ottoman Empire is in a, its a final spinal of, of a failure. He was suspicious of everybody. And uh, he would have very harsh penalties for whoever they could. Uh, by uh, 1907, the six room shrine had been completed. And what the covenant breakers did, they petitioned the Sultan himself. How, with the charges very similar to the original uh, four charges, that the four charges that was added. And since the Western pilgrims had started going to Holy Land, another charge was added in there. And that was that the Abu Baha is meeting with foreign military advisors. Of course, the Western pilgrims that were going to visit Abu Baha were presented as the foreign military advisors. And the process came through Nazem Pasha, governor of Syria, and the commission was sent uh, to Holy Land. This is the second commission of inquiry. The second commission arrived in the winter of 1907. It included four Ottoman officers as its member. It was highly influenced by the covenant breakers, specifically Mirza Muhammad Ali. And it, it was rumored that they were about to exile Abdul Baha to uh, Africa, specifically Tizan in Tripoli, which is, is part of uh, Libya in modern times, or execute him. And they kept Abdul Baha under house arrest and during that period, they also assigned many spies around the house of Abdul Baha. So anybody reaching or approaching Abdul Baha's house was reported. And he had put such a fear among the locals that no one would dare approach the house of Abdul Baha, including the poor that Abdul Baha had been supporting for many years. The commission themselves also stayed in the House of Abdul Ghani Beydoun, which was a neighbor and a friend of the Mirza Muhammad Ali, and behind he would have behind the scenes he would have uh, contact with the commission. Uh, these are the same charges as uh, I, I read before, and these were the, the same charges. And they, of course, the commission had access to all the records from the past. Abdul Baha, the commission wanted to meet with Abdul Baha. However, Abdul Baha refused to meet with the commission and instead wrote a, a letter to the Sultan himself. And in there, he states that he has not met with the commission. And uh, here we hear the words, the, the gist of what Abdul Baha had written to the Sultan you will find uh, his uh, responses to the charges quite interesting. He has rebelled against the government and established his own government. The reason that I am grateful to the members of the commission for the above accusations is that by their first complaint, they have, in reality, praised me and attributed great powers to me. How can a prisoner and an exile establish a new government? Anyone who could do that deserves to be congratulated. He has built fortifications on Mount Carmel. Similarly, by their second complaint, they have also commended me by ascribing to me extraordinary capabilities. 
It would be a miracle for one who was a captive in the hands of the authorities to build fortifications strong enough to be capable of withstanding bombardment by powerful naval ships. He, with the help of Mirza Zikrullah, have hoisted a banner with the inscription of Ya Baha'u'llah Pa among the inhabitants, including the Bedouins. But one is surprised by their third complaint, for how is it that many government agents posted all over the country have failed to see the banner which has allegedly been hoisted among the inhabitants of these lands? Perhaps during the last two years these officials have been asleep, or some angels have blinded their eyes. He owns two-thirds of the land in Akka. Concerning the fourth complaint, that I own most of the land in Akka and neighboring villages, I am willing to sell them all for the small sum of 1,000 liras. Friends, Abu Baha had a friend uh, who was Italian and also head of a shipping company. Also, he worked as a consulate of Spain in Akka. Since the rumors related to either exile of Abu Baha or possibly his executions were almost reality among many people, they thought he came and offered Abu Baha to hold the ship, and he had actually indeed had held the ship back for a few days to take Abu Baha out of Holy Land. However, Abdul Baha invited many of the Baha'is and told them and asked their advice of if he should go with the ship or uh, to, uh, to avoid whatever punishment was coming his way or stay in Holy Land. The consensus of the Baha'is were that he should leave with the ship and save himself. However, Abdul Baha answered that when the Bab was being taken to the gallows on its way. He did not, even though he had the opportunity, uh, run away. He stood for what was right. And for that same reason, he had no plans of uh, getting uh, out of Haifa, Akka area, and he stayed there. Uh, beyond that, on uh, July 24th, this is here, of course, what you see is the, what the shrine of Bob would have looked like in 1909 on Mount Carmel. On July 24th, 1908, the commission had come to their conclusion and their plan was to come over to Akka and they submitted to uh, or do with Abdul Baha as they pleased to. And from the Abdul Baha's house, you could see the ship is coming across the bay toward Akka, and everybody was concerned of what is going to happen to the master. Uh, Abdul Baha himself was just pacing the room and waiting. And however, when the ship got midway through the bay, it turned and went into the sea and disappeared from the sight. What had happened in Constantinople, bomb intended for the Sultan Abdul Hamid, had gone off, killed many. The Sultan himself was not injured, but many had died. So all the naval officers and all the commissioners were recalled to the capital. And as a result, the ship had changed direction and gone to the capital. Abdul Bahar refers that event, that event as the cannon of God going off and taking the chain of imprisonment from the Abdul Baha's neck and placing it on Sultan Abdul Hamid's neck. Because what happened beyond that, the Sultan Abdul Hamid was uh, removed from the position due to the pressures of the Young Turks revolution and all the political and religious prisoners were freed and ultimately the Khilafat and the Sultaniyat all uh, ceased to exist after that. 
and Sultan himself became the award prisoner of the state. And I here put the picture of the leader of the Young Turks Revolution, Ismail Anwar Pasha. Uh, and it is noteworthy to point out that when they freed everybody else, they did not free Abdul Baha. And they had to send a telegram and ask secondary that if Abdul Baha was included among the folks that are going to be freed, and of course he was, and he was freed from prison. Uh, these are some photographs of Abdul Baha around the shrine of the Bab. Uh, of course, the shrine shape of the shrine was a simple uh, six-room uh, building. Uh, uh, Abdul Baha on the first Nowruz of his freedom uh, in, in moved the remains of the Bab to the shrine and here we all hear the events uh, in the words of Bardian. I could never uh, be able to say it as eloquently uh, as, as the Guardian has stated so I'm just going to play his words. So. Every stone of that building Every stone of the road leading to it, he, Abdu'l-Baha, many a time was heard to remark, I have, with infinite tears and at tremendous cost, raised and placed in position, one night, he, according to an eyewitness, once observed, I was so hemmed in by my anxieties that I had no other recourse than to recite and repeat over and over again a prayer of the Bab which I had in my possession, the recital of which greatly calmed me. The next morning, the owner of the plot himself came to me, apologized, and begged me to purchase his property. Finally, in the very year his royal adversary lost his throne, and at the time of the opening of the first American Baha'i Convention, convened in Chicago for the purpose of creating a permanent national organization for the construction of the Mashrikul Adhkar, Abdul Baha brought his undertaking to a successful conclusion in spite of an incessant machinations of enemies both within and without. On the 28th of the month of Safar, 1327 A.H., the day of the first Nauruz, which he celebrated after his release from his confinement, Abdu'l-Baha had the marble sarcophagus transported with great labor to the vault prepared for it. And in the evening, by the light of the single lamp, he laid within it, with his own hands, in the presence of believers from the east and from the west, and in circumstances at once solemn and moving, the wooden casket containing the sacred remains of the Bab and his companion. When all was finished and the earthly remains of the martyr prophet of Shiraz were at long last safely deposited for their everlasting rest in the bosom of God's holy mountain, Abdul Baha, who had cast aside his turban, removed his shoes and thrown off his cloak, bent low over the still open sarcophagus, his silver hair waving about his head, and his face transfigured and luminous, rested his forehead on the border of the wooden casket, and, sobbing aloud, wept with such a weeping that all those who were present wept with him. That night he could not sleep, so overwhelmed was he with emotion. The most joyful tidings is this. 
he wrote a letter in a tablet announcing to his followers the news of this glorious victory that the holy, the luminous body of the Bob, after having 60 years been transferred from place to place by reason of the ascendancy of the enemy and from fear of the malevolent and having known neither rest nor tranquility has through the mercy of the Apa beauty been ceremoniously deposited on the day of Nauru's within the sacred casket in the exalted shrine on Mount Carmel by a strange coincidence on the same day of Nauru's a cablegram was received from Chicago announcing that the believers in each of the American centers had elected a delegate and sent to that city and definitely decided on the site and construction of the Mashrakul Azkar. Uh, of course, here we see Abdul Baha's picture in front of the shrine of the Bab at that time. And uh, other photographs of the shrine from that, that era. Also, these couple of pictures are from Dawnbreakers and they are the views of the shrine. Unfortunately, they are not as clear as I had hoped, but they are the pictures of the shrine at night. As you see, Mount Carmel is not developed at all during the time that the picture was taken. Uh, this is another picture. Of course, you see the shrine up middle of the mountain. And as you see, none of the mountain, even top of the mountain, have been developed. Uh, now, going forward, a Jamal Pasha, who was the commander of the Turkish Fourth Army Corps, uh, was put in, uh, in charge of the control of the Syria. This is, of course, after the Young Turks' success. He was a very vicious individual, and he had threatened to crucify Abu Baha and destroy the shrines of Bab and Baha'u'llah. And he was on his way to go ahead and fight the, in Egypt, to recapture Egypt, and he had to threatened, and this was recorded by the German consulate who reported to Abdul Baha, trying to get Abdul Baha to leave the Haifa Akko area, uh, that he would be coming back and from the battle. However, he lost the battle and none of those plans uh, came to pass. And Abdul Baha had predicted that, that none of those would come to pass. Here we see the, uh, what happened to the fate of the individuals that opposed the construction of the Shrine of Bob or threatened to destroy it. Uh, the four members of the Commission of Inquiry, this is of course the second Commission of Inquiry that was sent by Sultan Abdul Hamid. And the, they, their plan was the destruction of the Shrine on Mount Carmel. Suffered the fate, one was shot, another one was robbed of all his possession. A third was exiled, and the fourth uh, was sank into the object poverty. The individual that was shot was in Egypt, and he had approached the Baha'is in Egypt and asked for money and help. They contacted Abu Baha and asked Abu Baha if he was going to provide them help. And Abu Baha told them, any help you could, please provide them. However, by the time they tried to help him, he had already been shot. Of course, Mirza Muhammad Ali, who was the arch covenant breaker of Baha'u'llah, also the chief instigator of all these activities that took place against the Abu Baha and obstructing, obstructing building of the shrine of the Bab himself was stricken by paralysis and lived to see every hope he had cherished dash into the ground. Now, uh, they are coming many years forward, and this is the time of the Guardian 1940s. 
And Guardian had decided to improve or build on the shrine of the mob. And he had asked, and there were four architectural drawings that different architects had developed. Mason Remy was the architect that had came with the plan of building a superstructure over the existing building. Uh, a secondary design was put together by Sutherland Maxwell, uh, who was a Canadian architect that here you see the drawing of Maxwell Maxwell's on how he would see the building of the shrine and Guardian adopted the shrine of the design of Mr. Maxwell and the construction uh, of the superstructure begun in uh, 1952. Uh, as you see here, the, the additional excavation had taken place and the nine rooms of the shrine had been added in there without the superstructure. The March of 1952, the octagonal components of the Shrine of Bob was completed. And on March 4th, the Guardian described uh, the plan for marble colonnades and circle of the Shrine of the Bob and uh, intermediate steps of the building of the Shrine. Here we see a photograph, of course, of the Shrine that the superstructure is being built and partially uh, completed. And going forward, this is the workers are working on the roof of the superstructure. And further, we see here the dome as it's being covered and uh, being completed. This photo was taken in 1953. Uh, and here we see the worker installing the golden tiles on top of the shrine and preparing the shrine. And uh, we see a photograph, of course, of, from the city of Haifa and the partially completed shrine on the top. And this picture was, I believe, in, taken in 1950. Uh, it can't be right, uh, 1950, I'm sorry. And this is what, of course, the currently the shrine looks like. And 1953, 29th of April, in a moving ceremony, Guardian Shoghi Effendi placed a silver box containing the fragment of a plaster from the ceiling of the Bob cell in Maku under the tile of the golden dome of the shrine of the Bob. Uh, now here, we're going to spend some time about the details and the significance of each room within the Shrine of the Bob. Uh, here is a slide that describes the names of each of the gates to the structure of the Shrine of the Bob. Of course, as you see, the center room is where the remains of the Bob is buried and the Abdul Baha's tomb is has been for a nearly last 99 years in the room in the front here next to the Babe Ashraf. Additionally, here you see a numerical value of each of the rooms of the shrine of the Bab. Of course, uh, as you see, the, the center room is valued at five and the Abdul Baha's uh, remains is at room that is number nine. However, interestingly, when you added any direction, the sum of the numbers of each cell adds up to 15, both horizontally, diagonally, or vertically. And, and additionally, if you add all the numbers within the, every cell, the sum would be 45. And you see the significance of these numbers. If we use the abjad numerical system, the word Eve, or in, in Persian and Arabic, Habba, is one plus six plus eight or 15. And Adam or Adam, its numerical value is 45, the sum of all the cells. Additionally, the word Bob, in numerical value is five, and Baha, the numerical value would be nine, which multiplied five times nine would be 45. And this is the significance of the significance of each of the rooms within the shrine of the Bob. 
uh, in Rezvan of 1996, the terraces below the shrine uh, of the Bab were completed and opened to pilgrims. And in 2001, at dusk on the evening of the 22nd of May, of course, that is the time of the declaration of Bab, the opening of the terraces of the shrine of the Bab, a $250 million project began a 10 year, which had begun 10 years earlier was completed on 19 majestic terraces. And here we see the entirety of the terraces uh, placed. Uh, additionally, we see another photograph here of the shrine of the Bob and of course the uh, cypress trees circle located on the horizon. This is a modern time photograph of the shrine of the Bob. And this is the evening uh, picture of the same shrine with the terraces lit up. Uh, and, and in this photograph is the interior of the shrine of the Bob that you're looking at. And that brings us to our original chart that we had related to the uh, where the location of the remains was. Uh, we are clearly on the shrine on Mount Carmel and it will be continuing uh, going forward. At this point, I like to make a, a short tribute to Abdul Baha, whose effort, this achievement of building of the shrine of Bob was among the hardest missions he was given by his father, Baha'u'llah, to produce. And here I, I thought it would be interesting to perspective to look at how Abdul Baha was described by Edward Granville Brown. Many of the Baha'i friends have heard Baha'u'llah's description by Edward Brown. Uh, however, he also has written about Abdul Baha and a, uh, here we listen to uh, what he, how he describes Abdul Baha. Seldom have I seen one whose appearance impressed me more. A tall, strongly built man holding himself straight as an arrow with white turban and raiment, long black locks reaching almost to the shoulder, broad, powerful forehead indicating a strong intellect combined with an unswerving will eyes keen as a hawk's and strongly marked but pleasing features such as my first impression of Abbas Effendi the master Aga, as he par excellence is called by the Babis subsequent conversation with him served only to heighten the respect with which his appearance had from the first inspired me. One more eloquent of speech, more ready of argument, more apt of illustration, more intimately acquainted with the sacred books of the Jews, the Christians, and the Mohammedans could, I should think, be scarcely found even amongst the eloquent, ready, and subtle race to which he belongs. These qualities combined with a bearing at once majestic and genial made me cease to wonder at the influence and esteem which he enjoyed even beyond the circle of his father's followers. About the greatness of this man and his power, no one who had seen him could entertain a doubt. Friends, here I decided to put in the proposed shrine of Abu Baha's uh, architectural uh, drawings and pictures that, uh, as uh, John indicated at the beginning of the talks, will be dedicated next no November of 2021. Uh, here, of course, is the Garden Plaza approaching the shrine. Uh, 
followed by here is the front entrance of the shrine. Of course, as you see, the door is the, located in this location. And uh, here we see a, a grounds around the shrine, uh, how they would appear. And of course, uh, last but not least, we see the tape picture of the shrine that was taken, would be a drawing of the shrine at night, a bird's eye view of the shrine. Uh, this brings my conclusion, my talk to a conclusion. If there are any questions, I would be glad to answer it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Afnan. So we do have some questions. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask is, given the circumstances today with the pandemic, with all of these difficulties that people are enduring, and the Baha'is, the goal to build the Shrine of Abdu'l-Baha, the very person with great sacrifice, with great well, not just sacrifice, but with great emotion, finally set in place something that was deemed by our stand, by my standards at the very least, my humble standards, almost impossible to do, given all the people that leagued against him. My question is to you about the shrine of Abdul Baha, what you think the significance is in the building of this shrine today for the Baha'is? Well, Abu Baha clearly needs to be recognized for the impact he had on developing the community of the religion of his father, extending it to the West. And indeed, he is worthy of having his own shrine and not be a part of the shrine of the Bab, even though being next to the remains of the manifestation of God is a uh, worthy and praiseworthy location. I'd like to share a different story with you, and that is related to the, sh sh the House of Bob in Shiraz. The House of Bob in Shiraz originally was uh, changed by the request of Khadija Bagom, the wife of the Bob, after the martyrdom of Bob and was modified to look differently than what it was because the house was reminding of her a great deal, reminding of her life with Bob a great deal. And after her passing, the house had been left in the modified form. At one point, Abdul Baha wrote a tablet asking the spiritual assembly of Shiraz to modify the the house to its original form. Of course, the political situation in Iran was not a conducive to Baha'is doing activities. So they really did not want to get involved with that activity because they were afraid. And so they wrote a letter back to the Abdul Baha telling him that they ought to stop and, and wait until the political situation is better before they would try to make construction of changing the house of the Bab. Abdul Baha wrote back to them and said, a worthy captain will sail the ship regardless of how tough, how rough the sea is. Go ahead and start the construction immediately. Of course, there were a reason that later on became apparent. The, among the builders of the house and a relative of the Bob who was involved in modifying the house from the original shape back to the modified version was still alive and he uh, helped in the construction and making the house back to what it was. Remember, there were no architectural drawings at that point. And once the house was done, shortly thereafter he died. It brings me to the point, a righteous captain would sail the ship no matter what the conditions. So the pandemic, this and that, are the rough seas that we need to sail the ship through. Yes. 
that is uh, that is very beautiful and um i i agree <laughs> that being said there is a question from mr alex boyson from norway his question is how could the coffin be stored vertically in a closet if he understood correctly concerning the presumably loose fractured contents that was his question okay the of course, we got to remember that the remains had been placed in the box some uh, 50 years earlier. And the, uh, they were clearly, I have no doubt, while there is no place one will find detailed discussions, they were wrapped in the shroud. And in addition to the shroud, they had added flowers. Uh, Soleiman Khan himself went out and put flowers around the remains. And on one occasion, and this is uh, somewhat lengthy, but the, in one occasion that the box was outside of the hand of the Baha'is and somebody broke into the box, a piece of the clothing or the shirt of the Bob was cut out of the coffin and the coffin was packed again. Uh, that piece of clothing is today at Baha'i archives. If you go in there, you see a bloody, with a bullet hole shirt of His Holiness the Bob that is present, that is where it comes from. I suspect the box, because of the transportation, it, is, it could not be always kept horizontally. Additionally, on many other places that it was hidden, it was hidden in walls, which it means it was hidden in a vertical form. So it probably was packed with additional material so the inside was not loose or moving. That is, however, there is, uh, one cannot know for a fact. So we had a, a message from one of the participants who said that the golden tiles were made in NL uh, in a city called Utrecht. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the city name that well, but uh, uh, that was a contribution. Um, the question is, uh, the source from Edward Brown, is it published anywhere? Where can one yes. find it? Uh, one could find it in the, uh, uh, give me a moment, the Edward Brown and the Baha'i Faith. Uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with the book. Uh, I don't remember the page number off the top of my head to tell you what the page number is. However, uh, I could uh, down the line uh, send you an email with the page number of the. Uh, okay, uh, great, great, and we can we can send it to that uh, to that person. <laughs> yes. Thank you, thank you. And further, uh, we have another question. So, with. Uh, with regards to the shrine of Abdul Baha that's being built today, the question is about the money that's being spent. So right now they've raised, uh, for example, uh, uh, six million. What is the goal to, to actually finally build that shrine for Abdul Baha? And I'm not certain. I'm not certain, frankly, what the total budget and the other details of the shrine are to share with you. I believe that was announced sometime earlier. However, I, I don't recall. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fine. Um, the other question is about the uh, sacrifice and the hardships that Abdul Baha endured in interring the Bab's remains in building the shrine of the Bab. Um, uh, how long did it take Abdul Baha to actually uh, put all this together? I'm aware that, for example, some people didn't want to sell land to the Baha'is either to even actually build anything on that land. Yes, during the presentation, there was a reference that Guardian is talking about and Abu, referring to Abdul Baha, saying the landowner did not want to sell him the land and he prayed prayer of the Bob over and over that calmed them down and the owner came to him the next day. This is the land for the plot, not a large portion, just where the uh, 
small uh, piece of land around the shrine that was being referred to. Indeed, and of course, if somebody knows there is something you really want badly, they would want to charge you as much as they possibly could. So I suspect some of that might have been going on. Oh, yeah. It, I uh, I heard a I heard a story about it where uh, the the sacrifice uh, the in in different stages of buying the lands just for the Baha'i shrines as we have it today, the patience that the Baha'is endured uh, waiting for people to eventually provide the land uh, who, um, as a result of their regret for doing so, would eventually provide the land anyway, because their reasons to not provide the land was simply because they were Baha'i, not because they didn't want to sell the land. Yes. So uh, to, to me, it's intriguing. Uh, the, 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 the ability that somehow that the Baha'i community overcame this outright uh, prejudice that was so clear, so brazen, and, and so uh, accepted. <laughs> um, my question is next. So what is for the, uh, wait a second, there's another question that came in. Okay, sorry, uh, this is more important. Uh, can you comment regarding the recollection of Ria Hanum about the Bob's remains? Okay, the recollection meaning, I, I assume, a time that she allowed to certain believers to have a pilgrimage to the remains. Uh, that is what, in my presentation, I touched on it. Certain members of, relatives of the Bob, members of the Afghan family, mm -hmm. where they lived at that time in uh, Egypt, and they had a business, they were pioneering in Egypt. However, their business was pillaged because of religious prejudice and all their earthly possessions were removed. Abdul Baha called them to stay in Holy Land and while they were staying they were clearly uh, agitated and Ruhi Khanam to help calm them down allowed them to have a pilgrimage to the remains of the Bob that was in a, as we discussed in a box in the closet and the account of that one of them actually has written the account of her, their stay in Holy Land, and that is in detail described there, and that is what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I said Ruhiya Khanam, I meant to say Bahiya Khanam. Sorry, slip of the tongue. No, no, that, that, was, the, uh, that, that was the question that was asked. So that, that was uh, my fault. Sorry about that. Um, ah, no problem. The next question is about, um, so I, I'm actually provided information from someone who's aware per the Baha'i News uh, Service. Work presses on at the site for the Shrine of Abdul Baha as per the World Baha'i News Service. Uh, despite slowdowns in aspects of the project to ensure the safety of personnel on the construction site, foundational work advances and nears completion. So that's great. Yes. Uh, my question to you now is, uh, do you know about uh, the, the significance of the Bob's mission and the internment of his remains, uh, the significance of this in terms of religious history? Um, I haven't heard of anything of this nature happening uh, in religious history where uh, something so intricate, so, so, uh, so fragile what came to fruition when so many times the Bob's remains were probably almost discovered. Uh, what, what is your uh, comment on this, having uh, some more understanding and some more um, uh, knowledge about the events that transpired prior to the interment of his remains, finally. Well, as related to that, as the prayer that I read for the opening of my talk, saying, 
is, I say God suffices, I'm sure uh, the portion of the prayers from Bob says, uh, all things in the heaven and on earth, but God suffices. So God is aware of everything and the will of God is supreme over all events. Even though as humans, we think we have uh, our free will and we indeed do, our free will does not supersede the will of God. Whatever is the will of God will take place, regardless of us as humans helping it or trying to prevent it. And we would not be able to ever change the will of God. And this discussion can become philosophical and quite in depth and probably beyond the scope of our conversation today. However, uh, at the end of the day, it was the will of God and the significance is uh, actually retrieval and hiding of the remains of the Bob and moving it in place to place is among the very first actions of what is to become the Baha'i community. And it was a well done indeed, because uh, remember, uh, the authorities were looking for the remains, the friends, wanting to show their respect toward the frame, we'll put, the, we'll put it at the danger of being discovered. And to begin with, the reason that the retrieval of the remains was a successful endeavor, you got to look at the parties involved. The clerics at the time thought that the they believed that the, if the Bob was a holy person, the wild animals would not attack his remains. And they wanted to prove otherwise. Uh, now, the soldiers that they had to run away and did not protect the remains, protect is a funny word, watch so it would not be stolen or removed, had done that and they wanted to hide that fact. And as a result of that, after the remains were removed, the clerics were happy because they claimed that the animals had consumed it, so it couldn't have been a manifestation of God, a prophet of God, the Bob. The soldiers were happy because they had done, in quotes, their job. So they were, well, and the Bobbies, uh, by having no one look for it, they were happy, so, they, so that resulted in the successful uh, that the, re the remains were taken to the silk factory. And that's it, you know, made, as I said, quite involved discussion, if, especially if one wants to look at the details of who, what, when, and where. So we've had two questions pop up, um, some on YouTube live. Uh, three questions, actually. Uh, I won't, I'm going to ask this one person's two questions together as it's uh, very related. <clears throat> it seems more and more attention is being paid to the life of the Bob and his teachings and his mission. Would you agree? And then the second part of the question is, how should we think of the Bob in the light of the Baha'i revelation? And I think that what you just mentioned partially answers that question already. But those are the two questions. Well, I, I respectfully do not agree with the first assertion that we are now studying the life of the Bob more, more than before. Uh, unlike many other religions that there is the founder, there is the manifestation of God. In the Baha'i dispensation, there are two stars. Now, and one could imagine a Bob's station similar to that of John the Baptist compared to Christ. However, Bob himself was a manifestation of God, a prophet that brought books, uh, books of revelation. Uh, if we look at the, uh, Bob was very meticulous in keeping track of his writings. He has written two books uh, called Book of Index, or Kitab al Fehrest. In there, he documents what has been revealed and the size of those revelations. And in each case, is around, 
250,000 verses had been revealed. Uh, additionally, the largest book of any revelation, the Kabul Asma, which is the, among the last books that Bob revealed in prison of Chehrir. Uh, its complete form, I believe there is not in existence among many uh, places. There are portions of the book that are kept because Unlike other books, the book is uh, 19 chapters, and each chapter is 19 sections. Uh, and all 360 is covered, and that the size of the book is around probably 4,200 4, pages. Uh, as you know, uh, the book of Bayan is partially completed. Uh, Bob stopped after the 11th chapter, he did not reveal the rest of it. The rest of it was left for the one whom shall God make manifest, Baha'u'llah, to complete the book. It, this is symbolically very valuable and symbolically it shows that the revelation of God was not completed until the revelation of Baha'u'llah was completed. And uh, by the way, just to make the story full, Guardian Shoghi Effendi uh, talks about this and he says the Kitab -e Iran is the missing chapters of Bayan or unrevealed chapters of Bayan. They are really not missing, they are unrevealed. That's intriguing <laughs> and very, very intriguing. I have a question, given that uh, we've spoken about uh, the Baha'i literature, there is a question from Alex Carlberg from St. Pete Beach, Florida, who asked this question regarding the Tablet of Visitation. In his Tablet of Visitation, Abdul Baha says, make me as dust in the pathway of thy loved ones. Alex's question is, is the intention that people will walk on the landscaping over the top of the shrine? That was his question. I don't believe so. Abdul Baha is talking about a metaphorically related to him being the dust and people meaning that he would be supporting the friends at all levels. It doesn't mean physically going and walking on this dust or the other dust, or walking on the landscaping. Uh, you got to look at it in the metaphor metaphorical form versus a physical form of the statement. And it shows Abdul Baha's view that he considered himself a lowly person, uh, humble. This is, shows the humility of Abdul Baha. And so, his love for the friends. Yes, very much so. Um, the, the, the words that Abdul have, have used has always emulated that humility indeed. The question we have locally from Clearwater, we have a question from Jeremiah from Clearwater. His question is, the remains of the Bab and Anis are entombed together in the shrine in one resting place, correct? That is absolutely the case. That goes back to the day of the martyrdom of Bob. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, remains of the Bob, or the body of the Bob and Anis, who was trying to shield himself, shield the Bob by his body, mm -hmm. received uh, 250 bullets. Remember, the type of weapon that was used then was the muskets. And muskets don't hit the target well, but when they hit the target, they do immense amounts of damage. So the two remains were essentially one as a result of the uh, attack, as a result of the uh, execution of Bob, the method that they choose to do that. So separating was nearly impossible. And that is why the Anis will always, his remain and Bob's remain, essentially became one, especially in the area of the mid-body, the chest. Mm -hmm.
so uh, for those who are who are watching this, uh, this is this is my question. Uh, we are currently in the 200 year anniversary of the birth of the Bab, who was born 200 years ago as of last year, 2019, but we're still in that year before the next birthday um, is celebrated by the Baha'is around the world. This is, again, uh, the 200th year anniversary, if I restated that, the 200th year anniversary, 200 years ago, 1819, the Bab was born. My question is as to the significance of time in how everything is unfolding. Um, it's, uh, it's very intriguing to me that when the Bab was first martyred, there was a plague that and a dust storm that completely shrouded, that overtook the city of Shiraz, something that was recorded, right? Well, that was city of Tabriz, maybe. I'm sorry, in Tabriz, excuse me. <laughs> as, a, as a result of uh, 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 speaking and being intent on the question, I completely misstated that. Tabriz, indeed. Tabriz being the city that the Bab had been martyred in. Uh, Shiraz being the city where the Bab was born, for those watching. Sure. Uh, the question that I have is, it's 200 years after the, the birth of the Bab, and for the first time ever in world history, we have a pandemic that has caused nations to tremble, people seized in fear and in agony, and ec the, ec the whole economy of this world it's not per se in shambles, but it is definitely teetering and tottering far more than anyone has ever seen as visibly as it is so. My question is, given all this tumult, this earth-shaking reality that we're living in, what is your perception given the timeliness of this event? Well, that is actually God's will, and God does as He will it. Related to the challenges that humanity is facing, based on the Baha'i writings, until we come to a recognition of the unity of uh, humanity, unity of religion, and the challenges of the humanity will increase until such a time that people will come to the recognition they come. And many of those are done in the hands of the uh, people themselves. Uh, and what we see is some of those challenges that is uh, facing humanity today. Uh, and I could not really uh, add any additional significance there may be others, I'm just, it is the will of God. And it, it, he does as he will it. And we are spectators in this amazing drama that is unfolding. That is most certainly the case. Uh, all we can do is be prayful and do what is asked of us. And wish for the best. And the best doesn't mean what we think is the best. I'd like to clarify that. Yes. Yes. And uh, these spiritual forces that work, we, uh, we can only see the manifestations of them and, and uh, maybe one day know their significance. <laughs> yes. There is a question we have from uh, George and Faride Vaya, who are attending the Zoom chat right now. They're from uh, Jupiter, Florida, out just um, the other coast of Florida. Um, thank you so much, Janab al Athnan. My lovely wife, Farida, is so happy. You have brought back such wonderful memories of her time in 1978 when she was invited to attend the 100th anniversary of the Baha'i faith in Burma. Baha'u'llah himself had sent Syed Mustafa Rumi to Burma in 1878, and the result of his devotion and teachings for which he was martyred, the faith grew, especially in a town outside of Rangoon, that the master subsequently designated Abdu'l-Baha village. And Sayyid Mustafa Rumi is buried there.
For the 100th anniversary celebration that Farida attended, several of the Baha'is there commented that they too were fifth generation Baha'is. Only three foreigners were allowed to attend. Councillor Payman from Jakarta, Dr. Munji from India, and by the blessings and bounties of Baha'u'llah, the, Baha uh, the Baha'i community of Thailand asked Farida to attend, which she joyfully agreed to do. The Burmese government allowed these foreigners to attend on the condition that they do not talk during the ceremony. So Farida's question is, Janaba Afnan, have you ever been to Burma, now Myanmar? Somewhere in their records, uh, that of uh, George and Feride, uh, they have the cable and pictures from what wonderful celebration in what was then Burma. Unfortunately, I have not had the opportunity to travel to any part of Southeast Asia, including Burma. However, given the change of circumstances, I would love to be able to travel to Burma. And thank you for clarifying the details uh, related to the uh, representative that Mr. Rumi that Baha'u'llah had sent. And I'm not Janab Afnan, I'm just Jamshid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And for those uh, listening, uh, Janabe is a respectful term that. Uh, was used by the, and still is used by uh, people who speak Farsi, uh, the Persian language, which is where the Baha'i faith originated from. Janabe means mister, but it is a respectful way to say mister to another person. And uh, Baha'is uh, around the world will use uh, the, the word uh, Janabe or mister when uh, they're referring to uh, each other and others. So it's not just confined to Baha'is to say Janabe. If you're called that, uh, it is a sign of respect. Uh, that being said, uh, Alex Boyson from Norway has asked this question. How might we show respect to an Afnan when we see one? Okay. Afnan is no different than any member of the community. Uh, Baha'u'llah has given the relatives of the Bab, the title Afnan, which translates to the word twigs. And he has given them two uh, qualities, a special, and one is uh, the responsibility, the first one is to teach the cause. Yes. Uh, and the, And the second, at the moment, uh, escapes me. However, there is no position that Afnan has yes. beyond the, uh, actually to stay, to help humanity is the other responsibility that Baha'u'llah has given the Afnan. To help humanity and teach the cause. Uh, and there is no uh, additional uh, position. And I'm just a lonely member of the Baha'i community and that is all there is, and every other member of the Afnan would be in that same category. No, that's why I said my name is not Janabe, it's just Jamshid. Well, that, that is a very excellent point, because a lot of people coming from different backgrounds and understandings, uh, they, they come from, of course, backgrounds where uh, this is not clear. So it is a very beautiful thing that the Baha'is have this clear teaching from Baha'u'llah and well, from the Bab himself with his own humility, he also was re remarkably known for uh, this, uh, this beautiful knowledge that we have, these gems of wisdom and understanding. That being said, um, another question is asked as to, and this is just a general question, Another question is asked as to uh, the station and title of the Bab and the station and title of Baha'u'llah and their relationship to one another in terms of the shrines that we have in Haifa. What is the, what is the significance of having the shrines in Haifa in Israel today? 
clearly, if we go back, I'm going to try to answer the last question first and then last part of the question first. If we the Baha'u'llah uh, exile or Baha'u'llah being located in Akka, even though it is far, far removed from where he was born, and it would be unlikely that he would have even traveled to Akka. If we go to the Islamic traditions, the station that Muhammad and Imams identified for the Akka shows the significance of Akka. Um, mainly, you find a number of those. Baha'u'llah himself refers to them near the end of the uh, Tessels to the Son of Wolf, those traditions related to Akka that I'm referring to. Islamic traditions in general, you know, there is a question in some cases of how valid they are. However, if a manifestation of God has quoted them, in my mind, there is zero reason to believe that there is any question related to those. So the, why would Akka be significant if it was not for the, the fact that the manifestation of God would live and stay in Akka? Additionally, the mountain of God from Jerusalem and was moved uh, to Mount Carmel. And that is the heart of Mount Carmel, of course, is the remains of the Bab. And Baha'i faith is actually interesting and unique in this regard that the, our holy places and administrative places are co-located in the same place. We do not distinguish between those because even our administrative places are spiritual activities. That is why they are co-located. Now, coming to the station of Bob and Baha'u'llah. Bob, of course, was a manifestation of God in Baha'i terminology. And a, as in his lifetime, he predicted or he foretold the coming of the one, the term he used is the one whom shall God make manifest. And he was, of course, referring to Baha'u'llah. If you look in the, his uh, uh, book of laws, the Bayan, uh, we find the references to the one whom shall God make manifest is over 250 references to the one whom shall God make manifest. He was trying to prepare the community for coming of Baha'u'llah, the community of the Muslims, the world. And if you see the Baha'i laws were set up or were preparing some of the dogma that had become part of the life to be uh, destroyed, removed, and opening the path for when Baha'u'llah comes, the path will be open for people to be righteous and receive his message. Basically, every manifestation's job is to prepare the people that accept the next manifestation of God. And that was the relationship between Bob and Baha'u'llah. And, and uh, Manya's Haru'llah, is that uh, how uh, they say him whom God shall make manifest? Well, slightly, you're very close, and this is most my fellow Iranians pronounce it this way, but it should be man yos harullah. And yes, it, it is the translation of the words, the one whom shall God make manifest. Thank you for the proper pronunciation. As uh, I'm sorry, but you know, this is, this, I can't help it. No, no, that, that's exactly why I asked it. So we have a good pronunciation of that for people. Uh, English, Persian, what have you, speakers alike, to uh, well, listen you, and hear it. Can, can you say it one more time? <laughs> man, yos harullah. And you know, the only people that would challenge you on it is somebody who speaks Arabic, because they would say, this doesn't make, even though the pronunciation is very close. However, that is the Persian versus the Arabic pronunciation. Yes, but nonetheless, that is, that is very, very beautiful. And thank you for sharing that, nonetheless. And uh, we have, oh, um, I'm, I'm seeing comments, not questions, sorry. <laughs> so 
Uh, this of other course, the question, comments hopefully would not be to shut this guy up and throw him out. He doesn't know what he's talking about. No, 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 no. So uh, there's there's uh, a comment. Someone said Haifa is not only the world center of the Baha'i faith; it is also the word center of Baha'ifa Baha'ifa faith. Uh, the the way that it was spelled, I had no clue until today. <laughs> It just, uh, that's a very nice pun. Thank you, Mr. Vaya. Thank you. Um, that being said, the question uh, going back to the Baha'i faith being in Israel today, modern day Israel, um, it's, it's true that not only was the remains of the Bab carried with uh, the family of Baha'u'llah, with the Baha'is, but uh, Baha'u'llah was sent there as an exile, as a prisoner, no? Indeed, the Baha'u'llah was the exile and a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. Initially in Iran, Baha'u'llah was in prison in Siachal, which it means black pit. And after that, Baha'u'llah and his, was a, exiled to Baghdad. And after, after that, again, Baha'u'llah and his family were exiled to Adrianople. And then after Adrianople, uh, ultimately to the prison city of Akka, which is the in the Holy Land where we are talking about Haifa being across the bay from Akka. At that time, in the Ottoman Empire, Akka was the place that they sent political prisoners for a variety of reasons. Among them, the climate was really bad. Additionally, the moats around the city had not been drained and had been around for a long time, hundreds of years. As a result of the animals and other things dying in those moats and not being cleaned, there was a very foul order, odor uh, in the area. It is said that the odor in Akka was so foul that if a bird flew over the city, it just died and fell out of the sky because of the foul odor of the city. And that is how Baha'u'llah ended up in Akka versus on his own will or his desire to uh, arriving to, to be sent there. He was sent there as a prisoner. And the decree of the Sultan that sent him, not only sentenced him, but his entirety of his family were sentenced to be banished to the prison city of Akka. So there's a quote that I, I want to um, partially end on, which is about Akka. There's a quote that says, Blessed the man that hath visited Akka, and blessed is blessed he that hath visited the visitor of Akka. Blessed the one that hath drunk from the spring of the cow and washed in its waters, for the black eyed damsels quaffed the comfort in paradise, which hath come from the spring of the cow, and from the spring of Salvan, and the well of Zam Zam. Well, Zamzam. Zamzam, thank you. Well, is it with him that hath drunk from these springs and washed in their waters? For God hath forbidden the fire of hell to touch him and his body on the day of resurrection. That is an interesting quote from Islam. And yes. again, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mr. Afnan, Mr. Jamshid Afnan, for joining us today. It was a very, very filling, very, very, not just illustrative, but very kind gesture that you were able to come, spend your time, take the time to make this presentation and, uh, and enjoy our company as well. Hopefully enjoy our company, <laughs> all of us uh, participating today. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank everybody who had listened to this talk, and especially the organizers of the Zoom uh, gathering in clear water that allows friends uh, to learn, probably not from me because I'm just a lowly servant and don't know much, but other speakers, I'm sure, uh, were very informative and insightful ideas being shared, and I'd like to thank and I'd like to thank everybody who spent their hour or hour and a half listening to uh, what I had to share. Thank you. Thank you.
And again, for anyone who wants to join us next week, this is Baha'i Adult Learning happening every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Right now it is EDT, as I've learned, because we practice daylight savings and others don't uh, around the world. Uh, next week, we have a, as is, is a question that just asked to us, we have a mystery presenter who uh, we are actually, um, we, we have someone that we are right now uh, going to be having to present, but we're just hashing out a few last details. And uh, the presentation will happen next week, again, Sunday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, or EDT, given daylight savings. We will be continuing this throughout the duration of the pandemic. So as everyone is indoors and they are practicing social distancing, we are gonna continue these presentations as a result of, again, social distancing and not entering the Baha'i Center in Clearwater for the sake of the community and our safety. Uh, that. That being said, this is sponsored by the Baha'is of Clearwater, Florida. And if you wish to watch uh, similar um, sessions such as this one right now, please feel free to go to YouTube if you're not there already and search Clearwater Baha'is. After you search Clearwater Baha'is, the username for the Clearwater Baha'is account is just that. Please look at the videos that we have posted online. Quite a few of them will probably perk your interest and you will probably be having a lot to watch at one time because <laughs> you might not want to stop. That being said, we also have our Facebook page. If you go to www.facebook.com slash and the extension is Clue, uh, well, we have two actually now, but it's Clearwater Baha'i Center. So if you go to facebook.com slash Clearwater Baha'i Center, you will be able to access these videos from these sessions that are posted on Facebook Live to share with your friends and family. Thank you again, Mr. Afnan, for joining us. And we wish you all from the Clearwater Baha'is a beautiful weekend and Again, please check out our videos, uh, like this video, subscribe to this channel, and comment below any questions you have. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Allah Bye-bye. Allah Hafiz, dear friends.